today. Uh, Tom Durkin, who represents uh, Chris Foster, the Attorney General, is here on his annual trip with regards to uh, teaching us and making us aware of the Sunshine Laws as they are and anything that comes up. So uh, we want to certainly uh, welcome Tom because he uh, spends a lot of time with us in Christian County and he's often called upon to explain or to define whatever the statute is. So Tom, with that, welcome to Christian County. Thank you, Commissioner and citizens. It's nice to be with you. Uh, a couple of preliminary remarks I want to make. Uh, first of all, you're right. I, I think I've been here three or four times. And, and I never mind coming here because, as you might have overheard my conversation, in some fashion I'm returning home. I grew up in Springfield. That's where, at least where I went to high school and college. And uh, I always enjoy my time coming back to southwest Missouri. The other thing I, I want to say is uh, there are 114 counties in the state of Missouri, and I've been to every single one of them talking about the Sunshine Law, but in many cases only one time. And, and it's not because they liked me or they didn't like me. It's because I think that there are members of public governmental bodies who are not as interested in staying current with this law or being reminded of the law uh, in other places like they are here. And Case in point, I was asked to go to a major city on the eastern side of the state that is not St. Louis to speak to the city council. And they had had a number of issues with the Sunshine Law. Now, when I got there, uh, the city clerk came to me and said, we only have about 20 minutes for you. And I thought, you've had me drive an awful long way late at night to give you a 20-minute version of something that I'm not really going to be able to cover in one hour. And, and it just suggested to me that what they wanted to do was give the appearance that this really mattered to them. But the fact of the matter is, they didn't have an hour to give me. Uh, so I want to commend you uh, for inviting me regularly to come and speak, and spend an hour with you, and that's how much time I plan to speak. And then afterwards, if you have questions that I haven't covered, then I will stay as long as necessary. I will tell you I have a commitment to uh, be in Seymour around 3.30. So uh, process that into my travel time, but I will stay up until it takes me um, to answer all your questions and then get on to Seymour, which is in Webster County, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, um, that's the first thing. The second thing, the booklet I've given you. It says 2011 on it, and this booklet will serve you very well with um, two exceptions. And the first exception is this. I'd like you to go to page 56. Am I right about that? 55. 54 and 55. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, another one? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Who else needs one? Oh, okay. Let's do that. There's four. I've got, uh, I've got a couple more right here. Oh, you've got some right there, too. Okay. You're good. Okay. In the, as we're going to discuss or learn, any record that is retained by a public governmental body is subject to the Sunshine Law. If you've got it, it's subject to the Sunshine Law. And then you may exempt it from disclosure if there's a criteria in one of the sections, 610021, that allows you to exempt a record. Section number 18 on page 54 and 19 on page 55 have sunset. That is, when they were introduced to the General Assembly, they were given a certain period of time that if they were not renewed, they would terminate it. So it has, these have sunset. And uh, because we have a lot of smart attorneys in our office, I went to one of them and I said, give me a brief description of what has taken place here. So let me just read to you what they've given to me. Two exemptions to Missouri's open records law, frequently called the Sunshine Law, expired, expired at the end of 2012. One covers the operational guidelines and policies developed by law enforcement, public safety, first response, or public health authorities for preventing and responding to terrorism incidents. The other deals with security systems and structural plans of property that's owned or leased by a governmental agency. We expect the change to be short-lived as legislation has been proposed to extend these Sunshine Law exemptions. So as I speak to you today, these exemptions do not apply as exceptions. Legislation has been introduced into the General Assembly. Our office looks for some form of these exemptions to be reintroduced and enacted. But effective today, they are no longer part of the law. 
whatever complications those might pose to you should somebody ask for that type of information, and most of you will never have to deal with it, is something you need to take up with your own local council to see what you might do in order to uh, meet your needs in terms of privacy as it pertains to records like that. So that's the first thing I wanted you to know. The what second the other thing, page? Uh, it's, it's, it's number 18 and number 19, and so it's, okay. commissioners are 54 and 55? Yes. Yeah. And you'll see 50, on the bottom of 54 is number 18, and the top of 55 is number 19. And at the end of each one of those uh, provisions, uh, you can see the, the, sun, the sunset date that was reached. The other uh, piece of legislation, and here again, this will not apply to you unless you are the custodian of records, criminal records, but I want you to be mindful of it. Last year, House Bill 1647 was enacted. And it added a new chapter to the Sunshine Law, which deals with expungement of certain criminal records. Unless you're involved in law enforcement as a custodian and involved with certain criminal records, this will not apply to you. But it has to do, a person is allowed to apply for the expungement of certain criminal records after 10 years have elapsed for a specified misdemeanor and 20 years have elapsed for a specified felony. I wanted you to know that those two sections uh, in the law have changed. When our office sees exactly what's going to take effect uh, pertaining to the Sunshine Law in this legislative session, we will look at that once everything is uh, enacted or signed by the governor, we'll put out a new booklet. This booklet will serve your purposes for everything else. It'll help me meet the needs of the audience if I just have an idea of who are some of the entities that are here be it a concerned citizen or somebody who's part of the public governmental body. So as I, as I point to you, could you just say, that if you represent a governmental body or if you're here as a citizen or you're just curious, and I know I've met with you, Taney County, and it's a fire district, correct? Taney Mountain, no, fire district. Okay, very good. Sir? This County School District. Very good. Pleasure to have you, sir. City of Fremont Hills. Very good. Same? Okay. Madam? Christian County. Very good. And here? Christian County Crossroads. Ah, very good. Well done. Nice to have you here. Our allies. Okay. You're all my allies. Uh, Ma'am in the blue. Very good. And same. And sir? Very good. Okay. And sir? Citizen. Very good. Uh, MRTA, retired teacher. And we had met before when I spoke to a group of retired teachers just down the street from here. Correct, sir? At uh, Nixon. In Nixon. Thank you. Okay. Ma'am? Christian County Health Department. Okay. And sir? Same. And? Very good. And I know the commissioners. And, yeah, uh, sir? Very good. And that goes through here. Sir? Christian County Republican Central Committee. Very good. And, sir, right here? I'm Sparta City. Very good. And anybody else other than Sparta City? Okay. All Sparta. Very good. And the last row, ma'am? Citizen. Very good. And, sir? I'm one of the people as well. Very good. Well, for all of you, welcome. Let, let me, how many of you have heard me speak before? Okay, many of you. So those of you who have heard me before understand what I say at the beginning of every presentation. You get no better seat in heaven for putting yourself through purgatory on earth. <laughs> for those of you who have heard me before, I'll remind you of what you have now. Uh, I think it's always helpful if you understand who it is that's presenting in front of you, so I'm going to just give you a little snippet about who I am. Uh, I took my first job in state government in 1977, I was an aide to a state senator, worked in the Capitol building in Jefferson City, did that for three years. In 1980, uh, I was offered a position working for the Missouri Supreme Court as their communications coordinator. And I did that for two years. Communications coordinator. Think about this, 1980. There are no smartphones. There's no internet. There's no DVDs. So largely what I did is I went over and I observed what was taking place in the Capitol building and the House of Representatives or in the Senate. And I would come back and I'd pick up my rotary dial phone and I'd call the judges throughout the state and I'd advise them of legislation that was of interest to them and where it stood in the legislature on that given day. And how much more we can do. I mean, today you can sit there with a smartphone, you can record it all and send it out to the world spontaneously. Thank goodness that wasn't around in 1980 or I would have been unemployed. <laughs> in 1982, I left the state of Missouri. Uh, I went away for 25 years. Of caution to add, not in the way that law enforcement might use that term. But I went to New York City, and I uh, lived there for four years, and then I moved to Los Angeles where I lived for the ensuing 21 years. My final eight years in Los Angeles, I was a high school teacher where I taught media studies and American literature. 
people sometimes think, oh my goodness, you taught in Los Angeles, how did you deal with all that? But you must know that I taught in a very exclusive private school where mom and dad paid a boatload of money for their sons and daughters to have the privilege of a private education. And the issues that are often involved in an urban environment educational <coughs> system did not cross my desk. Um, I woke up one day and I realized I've reached the early autumn of my life. And I made the conscientious decision, I want to spend the balance of my life home in Missouri where I grew up. I returned to Jefferson City simply because it was the last town in the state where I had gainful employment. And I circulated a resume, it ended up on then the desk of State <coughs> Senator Chris Coster, who's a state senator from Cass County. And uh, I didn't know Senator Coster, nor did he know me, and when I gave him the resume he did nothing with it, until he was elected Attorney General. And then he remembered the resume of this guy who worked in government who had been a teacher. And he invited me to interview for the position that he, uh, <coughs> position he wanted to create in the office which he calls Public Education Director. And I recall the meeting with him very clearly. He was still in the Senate. He had not been sworn in in his first term as the Attorney General. And he said, whoever I select for this position I'm going to ask to travel the state extensively. And the first responsibility I want them to have is to talk about the Sunshine Law. I didn't know much about the Sunshine Law back then, so I looked at him quizzically, and he said to me, Tom, this particular law is perhaps the most non-complied with chapter in all the statutes. Why? Well, not because there's evil lurking in the hearts of men. It's not complied with often because it's complicated, it's nuanced, it comes closer to art than it does science, and art is interpretable. So in our office, when we see that there's been some complications in complying with the law, our first assumption is, they probably don't understand it well enough in order to comply. So our first response is, let us educate. And when I accepted the position, the Attorney General gave me a charge, get out there and teach this. And as I told you earlier, I've been to every county in the state talking about the Sunshine Law. We believe that if we can educate people well enough, that the heart of man is inherently good and that they will do what they can to comply. Sometimes people need guidance because there is a concern. And so we have in our office a new position, much like mine, that is dedicated to the Sunshine Law. And that person who holds that position is a young lady by the name of Brenda Siegler. Um, for those of you who would have a Sunshine Law inquiry, that's who it should go to. You might, you'll see me, you'll want to talk to me, but I'm not the guy. So it should go to Brenda Siegler, and Brenda spells her name B-R-E-N-D-A dot Siegler, S-I-E-G-L-E-R, at, giving you the email address, A-G-O, stands for Attorney General's Office, dot mo, dot gov. If you have a Sunshine Law related inquiry, send it to Brenda. I can tell you last year she had over 1,300 inquiries, and none of them could be answered with a yes or a no. And when I get Brenda's email address, there's a part of me I feel a little bit of guilt. And whenever I see Brenda when I'm back in Jefferson City, I say, you know, I'm sending a lot of business your way, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and she just looks at me with this wonderful angelic smile, and she says, Tom, job security. So Brenda responds to inquiries on the, on the order that they came in. Um, if you would have an emergency and you would need to speak with Brenda immediately, let her know that when you make the inquiry so that she can address that. Um, but as a rule, um, she will get to you as soon as she possibly can, and uh, she will respond to you giving you our best opine on a subject. It is not an official attorney general opinion. But it doesn't have the authority to do that, and you likely don't have the authority to ask. Your state representative would have that authority. The prosecutor's office would have that authority. But an, an average citizen who wants an attorney general opinion, you don't have the authority to ask, and we don't have the authority to give it to you. But we'll give you what we call an opine, which is our best direction on addressing the question that's posed to us. Sunshine Law. I've worked with this law now for four years, and I do not know how many times I've given this presentation. A lot. Over 300 times. And despite my... Uh, intimacy with this law. There is seldom a week that goes by where somebody doesn't pose a question to me to which I must say, let me get back to you. <laughs> and then I take that inquiry to our brain trusts and our governmental affairs division, and often I might sit in a room with three other attorneys who work with the Sunshine Law. By the way, I'm not an attorney, I'm a teacher. 
Uh, and I will pose the question to them, and it is possible that I get three different opines on the question. So here's the good news. Despite the fact we only have an hour, if we had a week, I may not be able to answer every question you have. But what I can do is frame the approach to the Sunshine Law in such a fashion as to guide you to be most likely to comply. Now, it's within that framework that let me just offer to you two different quotes from two different individuals that I think can kind of encapsulate one of the ways to look at the Sunshine Law. The first individual I want to quote is a colleague of mine. His name is Jeremiah Morgan. Jeremiah has the position in our office of Deputy Solicitor General. I had no idea what the Solicitor General did until I worked for the Attorney General's office, let alone the Deputy. Solicitor General's office in the office of the Attorney General are the attorneys who represent the state of Missouri on matters before the appellate bench. So we will represent Missouri in cases that involve the state of Missouri before the appellate courts, and the Solicitor's office handles that. Uh, Jeremiah is a man of great integrity and wisdom, and I was with him one day when he was getting counsel to someone over a speakerphone in his office, and the person on the other end of the line knew that I was there. And at the end of the conversation, the person said to Jeremiah, so Jeremiah, if I do that, is it legal? And Jeremiah's response, I think, is instructive because he said, if you have to ask if it's legal, are you sure that's the course of action you'd want to pursue? Jeremiah Morgan. Now, the other person I'm going to quote is the antithesis of Jeremiah. It's the vaudevillian W.C. Fields. W.C. Fields, for those of you who may not remember him, came out of the early vaudeville days and early films, did a number of comedies with Mae West. And it was often said of W.C. Fields that he never met a woman or a bottle of liquor that he did not want to spend the night with. <laughs> Colorful character. So at the end of his illustrious career, W.C. Fields, as the story goes, became quite ill. And a friend went to visit him in the hospital. And when he walked into the hospital room there, he saw W.C. Fields with a Bible in his hands. And he said to him, Bill, I've never known you to be a man of deep religious convictions. Why at this time a Bible? And W.C. Fields responded as only he could, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> W.C. Fields, Jeremiah Morgan. Are we looking for loopholes in the law? Or are we going to look at the law in such a way as to never have to ask if we're violating it? Within that context is where the discussion of this law can take place. And that's what I'd invite you to do as you're looking at the law and how it applies to you. Are you looking for a way to circumnavigate the law? Because of those 1,300 inquiries that Brenda Siegler gets, let me assure you, some of them, by the way they are stated, seem to be asking us, tell us how to not comply with this law and yet not violate it. And I think that that's important for all of us to keep in mind. I think that we need to understand what the presumption of the law is. And to do that, let's begin on page 45 in your booklet, where the law actually begins. Everything before page 45 in the booklet is instructive, and it's helpful, and I invite you to look at it at your leisure, but the law begins on 45. And on that page is where they give us definitions so that we understand what it is that they're talking about. What is public business? What is a public governmental body? On page 47, what constitutes a public meeting or a public record? And on 48, the final definition is what constitutes a public vote. The next section in the law is perhaps the most important section in the law when it comes to interpreting and complying with the law. And it says, section 610.011, that a liberal construction of the law is to be our public policy and exceptions shall be strictly construed to promote this public policy. In short, when in doubt, presume it is open. If somebody asks for a record, the presumption must be that this is an open record which I must share, unless there is an exemption in the law that permits me or compels me to close it. If I'm having a meeting, presume that people may attend that meeting. Mayor John was a, a devotee to the Sunshine Law. And as mayor, I can tell you that his presumption was always openness. And it always served him and the city council and the citizens of Jefferson well because their presumption was openness. Even when they could have closed a meeting. And I will give you an example. Um, at the last election, there was a proposition the citizens of Jefferson were going to vote on regarding a new tax to, that would be dedicated to our fire department. 
And proponents of this issue uh, suggested to the public that the budget for the fire department would be sacrosanct and what all new income would go to the fire department. <coughs> the city administrator sent out an email saying, not so. The budget of the fire department is going to be determined every year by the city council. And to think otherwise would be inappropriate. Well, those who were in favor of that particular proposition were incensed that the city administrator would use a public computer to send out information like that that they didn't like. And they called for his head. And so now this is a discussion that the city council has to have. The city council was entitled to take that discussion <coughs> behind closed doors because it's, a, it's an issue involving an employee, the city administrator. And by a vote, and I don't remember what the vote is, I think it was six to four, the city council determined that we will have this very difficult discussion in the open. And we will resolve this under the light of public scrutiny. And they did. And the public learned that no laws were violated by the city administrator sending that out. And that, in fact, office equipment within the city of Jefferson had been used on many times to disseminate important information about city government that is truthful. After that city council meeting, that discussion was put to bed because everyone knew the issues and how they were addressed and why they were addressed in the fashion that they were addressed. So John Landwehr always operated under the impression of we will do everything that we can to keep these meetings open, not everything that we can to close them. And yet there are times where the discussion is so sensitive that perhaps we do need to close it. There are people I meet whose uh, philosophy regarding the Sunshine Law is this. If you've got nothing to hide, you hide nothing. Keep everything open. And that played very well with me for a short period of time until one evening I was giving a presentation uh, in a county in the eastern side of the state, and it was a large, large gathering. And I think every person in the county who was a member of a public governmental body was there, and many interested citizens. At the conclusion of the meeting, a gentleman approached me and he said, I, I could use some guidance. He said, I was just named to a fire district board. And at my first meeting, we went into a closed session to discuss a personnel matter. Fire district board, talking about a fireman. And he said, I need to know what will be released from that closed session. And I said, well, under the Sunshine Law, you had the authority to close that discussion under 610021, subsection 3, hiring, firing, disciplining, or promoting an employee. And under that section, it says the following that all votes taken in that closed session must be a roll call vote. Your name will be assigned to a yes or a no. And that vote must be made available, made available within 72 hours after you've notified the person of interest. Don't let them read about the outcome in the paper. He said, okay, so the vote that we took, my name's going to be applied to a yes or a no. And that vote must be made available within 72 hours. I said, that is correct. He said, what about the discussion that took place? I said, that's closed. He said, oh, that's good. And then he followed up by saying, Tom, this fire district um, is part of a small community. And the person in question, the fireman, uh, is a good guy. And in fact, his kids go to school with my kids. The issue was alcohol use. He said, I had to say some things in that closed session germane to the facts that were likely to cause my colleagues to remove him. But I don't want that information bandied about our town because he's going to suffer enough when he goes home and he tells his wife, honey, I lost my job. That was the first moment that I had an inclination of how difficult it is to do what you do if you're a member of a board or a body or a commission. And I asked myself the question, what if I'm sitting on that board or that body and the fate of a man's future is in my hands? I told you I lived in New York, I've lived in Los Angeles. I'm not unfamiliar with walking down the street with people who had colorful lives. And some of my youth in Greene County was misspent. So I tend to be compassionate towards my fellow men when it pertains to their human frailties, because there, but by the grace of God, do I. Given that predisposition that I have, is it possible that I could sit in on a meeting discussing a person's future and their livelihood, I could release upon the public a person who at the time of an emergency is alcohol impaired, and that I have not served my public very well. And so to those who would say, if you've got nothing to hide, you hide nothing, I say, not so fast. Sometimes we might serve the public far better by having that discussion behind closed doors. 
and then allow them to know how I voted. Hold me accountable for that vote. But you do not get to be privy to the confidential, personal information involving that human person's life. Hold me accountable for the vote. And I think doing that in select circumstances is absolutely the appropriate way to approach this law as it pertains to when you might exempt people from attending a meeting under closed doors. Having said that, now let me share with you this. It's funny. The other day I was watching a, a movie on TV, and it happened to be a, the movie of a book that I used to teach when I was an American literature teacher. It's Arthur, it's Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible. And I was seeing the version with Winona Ryder and Daniel Day-Lewis. And I was taken back to my days of teaching that particular book. deals with the Salem Witch Trials, Salem, Massachusetts, 1692. People getting into a frenzy because they wanted to accuse their neighbors of consorting with the devil. Some people died as a result of accusations that were made about them. So I turned to my students at the time that were studying this, and I said to them, what's the opposite of love? And they all said hate. I said, what about fear? Wasn't it fear that motivated the response of these people in this small community of Salem, Massachusetts? Wasn't it fear? Fear of being accused of something that you could hardly defend. And the consequences was death. Wasn't it fear that caused this Christian community to act in a most unchristian fashion? It was fear. Fear of the unknown. When we go into a closed session, we invite fear to the equation. Because people don't know. So, the responsibility then of the public governmental body is to balance this. When do we best serve our citizens by closing those doors and making judicious, difficult decisions? And hold ourselves accountable for the vote. When do we say, no, let us keep this open despite the discomfort that it's going to generate, because that will serve the citizens better. And that's the balance, that's the tension that we have to live with if we serve on those boards and bodies. That's why I believe you are called to serve in those positions, to make those difficult discernments. But please be advised. The fact that you can go into a closed session doesn't mean that you should. And the fact that you can go into a closed session sometimes will serve the people better. You determine. But if you're going to go into a closed session, you've got to find one of those 22 provisions that begin on page 51. Actually, now it is 20. Because I told you the two that no longer are applicable. You need to find which of those are going to apply, and then you need to apply them. So that if somebody would ask you for a record, you could respond, in keeping with the sun sh sunshine law, and I'll talk more about that, and say, this record is exempt, pursuant to, and then you're going to cite the subsection that allows you to exempt it. How many of those 20, within seven days, are you allowed to not disclose? How many of those 20 within seven days are you allowed well, to Most of them you got to disclose within seven days. I think I understand your question. Depending on which one of those 20 that you use, that subsection will guide you as to when or if there's ever going to be disclosure. For example, the very first exception deals with legal action. And if you'll read that section, it will tell you when the information that was closed must be made available. And it's the definition and the guidance will be right in that subsection. Okay. And so each subsection has its own time. There could be subsections where it is never to be open. And the ladies in the prosecutor's office, I'm sure, know this. You have certain records that you might deal with that are going to be responded to in a whole other part of the law that it is not my intention to talk about today. Section 610, 100 and beyond, where you might be dealing with investigative reports, or when dis certainly uh, information that is pursued under discovery has its own set of standards that the Supreme Court has established, and uh, on those particular issues, in terms of discovery, if you have any questions, you and I can have a conversation and at another time. You discussing, if you're not on the school board, you're discussing the child mentality. You never have to disclose that. Um, I'm, I'm very hesitant to give legal counsel from the front, A, because I'm not an attorney, but the question that you pose to me, that there are certain I'm comfortable answering this way. There is certain information that would never be disclosed, and that is correct. HIPAA laws, FERPA laws, educational laws have their own set of standards and their own set of guidelines. And there is some information, yes, sir, that you would never disclose 
with the exception of certain agencies or entities that would have access to that information. So uh, I, I would say it's a the blanket general response. Public, no. The general public, no. The, the, public, the general public, there is certain information that they would not be entitled to receive. And, and, and I'm going to conclude it by saying, and all of this in our office is handled on a case-by-case -case basis. So, so I, I prefer that you not go back and say somebody from the Attorney General said, absolutely not ever. But if you do have a very specific question that your legal counsel from the board would like to discuss with our counsel, I would certainly see that that connection is made. So it could be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. You're very welcome. Some people look at the Sunshine Law as their opportunity to tell a public governmental body how to do their job, and it's not. It is their opportunity to view the good work of the public governmental body. I got myself in a little bit of a complication oh, a couple of years ago when a small town, not far from here, but not in Christian County, was having trouble with their local aldermen because the citizenry uh, was uh, objected to the fact that the council, or the alderman, changed their policy on how long you could speak before that public governmental body in an open session. And the citizens wanted to have a continued open mic that lasted indefinitely until they said everything they wanted to say, and the council said, no, we're now going to restrict this and you get X number of minutes. And that precipitated a lot of concerns, and they invited me to come and speak about the Sunshine Law. And I, and I casually, and maybe flippantly, made the comment, to try to break the tension, I guess, that there's nothing in the Constitution that mandates a political figure must listen to the people. And I paused and said, but I recommend that they do. When I was quoted in the paper, they failed to add the part after the pause. <laughs> and it did not play well when that newspaper article reached the office of the Attorney General. <laughs> so the Attorney General, who is no stranger to being out in public eye and perhaps not having a full quote conveyed, <clears throat> smiled at me and he said, welcome to public lifetime. Now I, I try to use discernment before <coughs> I open my mouth and say <coughs> things, but the point that I want to drive home is that there are some people who believe that the Sunshine Law is their entitlement to tell a public governmental body what to do, and it's not. It is their entitlement to observe what the body is doing. And in fact, in this case, with the citizen who wants to come before the body and speak, I, we've had citizens write us and say, well, they let me talk, but they never answer me. And there's usually a good reason why they may not answer. And I will get to that good reason momentarily. Page 49. What is the citizen entitled to as it pertains to a public governmental body? They're entitled to know when that body's going to meet. And so we begin on page 49 by looking at what it says under 610.020, Notice of Meetings. All public governmental bodies shall give a notice of the time, the date, and the place of each meeting, and its tentative agenda, in a manner reasonably calculated to advise the public of the matters to be considered. The body is going to post an agenda, and they're going to tell the people, we're meeting on this day, this time, at this location, and here's what we're going to talk about. Yes? Is there ever an exception to that, where there, that you don't ever have to post your meetings? <coughs> I cannot imagine an exception to that. They're very clear. If you're going to meet, it is your responsibility to post an agenda. That's what it says. And I don't. Yeah. See, there's nothing in there where I see. Now, there. Let me move ahead, and I will talk to you about <coughs> possible exceptions, but not to posting, but what might be posted and when. Okay. My friend John Landwehr, former mayor, is going to join me in Hannibal, Missouri, for a presentation, I think, later, uh, or mid-next month. And I specifically invited him because Hannibal had some situations where I think the wisdom of a mayor, who also knows the Sunshine Law, who is an attorney, would be helpful. So I invited John to join me. In preparation of that, John sent me uh, a facsimile of the county commission's agenda, not Christian County. And this county commission had on the top agenda for the county commission of a particular county in question. And it said, for the week of, and it said it had a five-day period in January. And on Monday, they said, commission will meet to discuss commission business. Tuesday, commission will meet to discuss commission business. Right on through to Friday. And John said, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I wrote back what John already knew. 
My thoughts are this is not in compliance with the Sunshine Law. Why? Because that is not a tentative agenda likely to tell the people what it is we're going to be talking about. To discuss commission business is a pretty broad topic. And that's not anything that I think is going to hold muster if somebody would bring action against that commission for not complying with the Sunshine Law pursuant to 610020. Um, and certainly, if somebody brought that to our attention from the public saying, what do you think, we would be in contact with that commission ASAP and say, no, no, you need to be much more clear than this. So the people are entitled to know what it is you're going to be talking about. Um, this is funny. When I was a teacher, if a kid would do that, they'd get an hour of detention. And almost every time, it was the parent calling the kid. I didn't know if it was an accident, but they just wanted to make amends for something that might have happened over breakfast that morning. It's not really working I have a, a blackboard that the Office of the Attorney General has given me, and no one has that number but the Attorney General, and he never calls me. <laughs> but it went off in the middle of an important meeting because the solicitor had gotten the number and now they were calling me. So here I'm thinking, well, I don't have to turn this on. Nobody's going to call me. And that's what happened. So we're going to now post this agenda. We're going to put it up there when? Let's go to page 50, number 2. Notice conforming with the requirements of subsection 1 shall be given at least 24 hours in advance, exclusive of weekends and holidays when a facility is closed. So we're going to post this notice at least 24 hours in advance, uh, not, cloud, not including weekends or holidays when the facility is closed. And the people say, well, what if something happens that we have to address and it's within that 24-hour time limit? Let's go to number four. When it is necessary to hold a meeting on less than 24 hours notice or at a place that is not reasonably accessible to the public or at a time that's not reasonably convenient to the public, the nature of the good cause justifying that departure from the normal requirements shall be stated in the minutes. If we need to discuss a topic, and it's after we've posted that agenda 24 hours in advance, we may do that if it rises to the level of a good cause to do it. And then you're going to put in the minutes why you deviated. So people will hold you accountable for that deviation. Now, now notice, nowhere in there does it say you don't have to post anything. It says once you posted it, if you have to deviate for good cause, deviate and then put it in the minutes why you deviated. Like for emergencies. Emergency is the word that I would use, Commissioner, in deference to good cause. Because there's no definition in here that says what good cause constitutes. So Tom Durkin, and I think the commissioner is right on board with this. We look at good cause as being interpreted as emergency. Not the fact that John brought it up and let's go ahead and talk about it while we're here. This is an emergency and we must deal with it. And I'll give you a, a profound example of what we consider to be an emergency in Jefferson City. Uh, almost three years ago, in Jefferson City, a 15-year-old girl murdered a nine-year-old girl. She stabbed her multiple times. Uh, I can tell you that she murdered her because she pled guilty and she is now incarcerated. Within 24 hours of that murder, which you can imagine how that hit the papers and also just the coffee shops. Within 24 hours of that murder, uh, a well-liked member of the faculty of Jefferson City High School committed suicide. So now we have these students in Jefferson City who are aware of one of their classmates, who I believe at that time was a sophomore, has murdered a nine-year-old girl. And we have one of our members of the faculty who's committed suicide. This school board was at high alert and had to do emotional triage immediately. So they met. And they didn't have 24 hours to post a notice as how we're going to approach these two very serious problems. And they put in their minutes why they had to do that. <coughs> no question in the minds of anybody in Jefferson City that they had an emergency. That was not a convenience. And that's the level of significance where I think, you know, things that matters of emergency mean that a person's mental well-being, physical well-being is going to be compromised if we don't act. I suspect you get ice storms here in Christian County. Ice storms could cause some very serious problems. You may have to go into a meeting and decide how are we going to respond to this today while the ice is here, not 24 hours from now. We have. You have. Okay. 
I wouldn't have any problem looking at that as an emergency, Commissioner. It would never come to me for adjudication, but my opinion is I wouldn't worry about that. You understand, those are emergencies, they're not conveniences. We had a past president that didn't have us posting our meetings, and we didn't know that we were in violation of the sunshine law, and for some reason, he, he, he had a reason that said that we didn't have to post our meetings, and he had an excuse, you know, and I was like, okay, and then he had me just paying, I'm the treasurer, and he had me just paying the bills, not knowing that I wasn't supposed to be paying him like that, and he had a reason that I could just pay him. Just when they came in, I could just pay him, write checks and pay him, and he had a reason that I could just do it like that. And I was like, when I asked him, you know, I was like, how come you said I could just pay the bills like that? How come you said we didn't have to post our meetings like that? There, he said, oh, well, I don't remember. I was like, let me, let me at least spin off of that question, and, uh, and let's go to page 47. For the definition of so what that's is why we're here. You know, page four, and that's good. <laughs> and that's why the attorney general asked me to travel the state. Yeah. Because remember how I said we do not look at it as if there's malice in the hearts of them. Yeah. We look at it as people need to be educated. Right. That's that's why we drove up here in, and, okay. we and that's why we drove up. Ozark County, we didn't know you were there. So. Let us go to page forty seven <laughs> and let's look at what what is the definition of a public meeting? Um, it's any meeting of a public governmental body, subject to the Sunshine Law, at which any public business is discussed, decided, or public policy is formulated. And then it goes on to say whether or not that's in person or on video or some type of technology. But then right in the middle there, I want you to look at that section that begins, the term public meeting shall not include an informal gathering of members of a public governmental body for ministerial or social purposes when there is no intent to avoid the purposes of this chapter. For you to pay the bills, I think that it would be reasonable to say this is administrative, ministerial, and therefore you gathering with your boss to pay bills is not a public meeting. You're taking care of administrative functions, mm -hmm. okay? I don't is know that, if that resolves your issues. Does that become true because it's a volunteer? No, it has nothing to do with whether you're a volunteer or whether you're paid. It has to do with what the definition of a public meeting is. When you're gathering there and you're paying bills, are you deciding policy? Because I'm presuming the policy was determined when you came up with your budget and said X amount of dollars is going to go in the following ways. That would be public. The public needs to know. The fact that you're just doing what you're responsible to do with being a, a good entity, paying your bills, is administrative. All right? And for further questions like that, let's you and I talk after the meeting. All right? Um, but there's other things that I want to make sure that I, I speak to. What else are the public entitled to know? Let's go to 610020 again. Uh, and with that, I want us to now start to look at the Sunshine Law as the least common denominator for good government. You comply with this law, that's good. You exceed it, it's better. Back to my classroom and these privileged young ladies and gentlemen who had the opportunity of this private education. I gave him homework every single night in American literature. It made me very popular with the kids. And every kid did his homework. Because if they didn't, I would approach them in class, and I would say, do you understand that you have cost your mother a Mercedes Benz for you to be here? Do your homework, or I'm telling mom. Mr. Kirk, I'm sorry. And that was the problem. That went away. They all did their homework. <coughs> Having said that, homework in American literature was always to read something and I'd ask a question. Write me a short essay in response to what I've asked you. Every kid submitted that the next day. But as I was reading those essays, it was evident to me which student had done his homework, complied with the least standard of Durkin's law, while simultaneously listening to his iPod, Googling everything in the world, watching YouTube, talking on his cell phone, playing a DVD, playing Monopoly, didn't matter. And they would do that because they said, well, it's multitasking, Mr. Dirk, and I do a lot of things well. I will not share with you what I said in response to that. <laughs> but I doubted their integrity. Those students all did their homework, and they complied with the least standard of Dirk's <clears throat> law. Now, some students submitted to me the next day uh, a submission that reflected them at the highest level of integrity. 
and it was the latter students who came to me in the spring of their senior year, almost without exception, and said to me, Mr. Durkin, I was accepted into the university <coughs> of my choice. So which student would we be? Are we going to comply with the least standards of the law? Okay, the Sunshine Law says we got to have the date, the time, the place, members absent, members present, or record, or roll call vote, I'm done. Or are we going to be the student who has intentions to live at a higher standard? And that's what I invite us to do. So I'm going to invite us to create this document, this journal, these minutes, that reflect the flavor of the exchange. <coughs> Not a transcript. The flavor of the exchange. Why? Because one day you're not going to be on that public governmental body and I'm not going to be the public educator. And we are going to be succeeded, not replaced. <laughs> and those who would succeed us will now have benefit of our wisdom by the documentation we've left behind. It becomes the compass to guide them. And they profit from our collective wisdom over the years as seen in these minutes or our collective folly but either one of those are instructive. Do it that way. Look how it served them up. Don't do that. We now know. That's a bad idea. So I'm going to invite you to go to the furthest extent that you can, that's reasonable, and create documents that will serve that body in perpetuity by giving us information about the flavor of the discussion and how it was that we reached these very difficult decisions. And that includes closed sessions. And the first thing that I get in protest, so I'm not keeping elaborate notes of a closed session, because if I do, somebody's going to ask for them, and then they're going to sue me. Fair question, particularly in the litigious world in which we live. So I took that question to our general counsel. This is the man that the attorney general goes to and says, give me the benefit of your wisdom. And his name is Ron Holliger. He's a former judge of the Western District Court of Appeals. And he was also a circuit court judge, and prior to that, he was in private practice. He's a man of great wisdom. And when I approached Judge Holliger, and I said, so what do I say to these people who say, I'm not going to create extensive notes from a closed session because somebody will sue me. And he just smiled, and he said, Tom, no attorney needs minutes from a closed session in order to bring legal action against a governmental body. They can do it without those closed session minutes. But if they do, I want you to know this, Tom. The Sunshine Law says those minutes are to be protected. And they are not to be made available to outsiders. People say, well, then what if they get a subpoena? And they say, we're going to subpoena you for those minutes. And the judge say, then the body will get their attorney to quash the subpoena. Say, no. And we will let the judge determine what, if anything, shall be released. And if a judge would say, well, there is some information here that is so significant that the public must see it, I'm going to order that part be released. Here's what's going to be revealed how difficult it was to make a decision. And some people will not be happy with the outcome of that decision. Because, and I'm sure the commissioner knows this firsthand, if you are pleasing everybody, you're not doing a very good job of it. Amen. So I would say to you, keep those minutes. They are close <coughs> to the body in perpetuity so that as some new member comes and succeeds you on the body and they want to look at what was in the closed session minutes from two years ago, they have access to it for their benefit, but nobody else does, short of a court order demanding it. And I'm going to tell you, my sense of the judiciary is the judges are going to be very, very hesitant to release information that the Sunshine Law says is otherwise closed to the public. Let us go to 610 It's been a couple of weeks since I've given this. Actually, about a week since I've given this. Let's go to page 63. Actually, I want you to go to 64. Page 64. Section 610028. It's item number two. It reads, in part, Each public governmental body shall provide a reasonable written policy in compliance with the Sunshine Law, open to public inspection, regarding the release of information of any meeting, record, or vote. Each <coughs> public governmental body shall create this document that tells the public how it is we're going to release information to you. And so in Cole County, where I live, that means the Cole County Commission has to have this document. Also, the Jefferson City Council has to have it. The Library Board has to have it. The Fire District Board has to have it. The Office of the Attorney General has to have it. Everybody is required to create this policy, telling the public how it is we're going to comply with Sunshine Law requests. 
I'm going to share with you uh, excerpts from the policy statement of the Office of the Attorney General, because I think it's instructive. For those of you who may not know if your public governmental body has this policy, uh, I invite you to look into that at your earliest convenience and say, do we have this policy in compliance with the Sunshine Law? <coughs> if you don't, we have a template that you can borrow from. It's found on page 38. Okay? Now, the policy I'm going to read to you, um, we created, it borrows from the template on 38, but don't try to match those words on 38 with what I'm going to read to you because we, we changed it, we modified it to meet our needs. Our policy reads as follows. In accordance with the provisions of the Sunshine Law, the following is adopted as the policy of the Office of the Attorney General. One, that the Deputy Attorney General is appointed custodian of the records for the Office of the Attorney General, and such custodian is located, and we give the address of the Supreme Court building. So if you're going to contact us for records requests, and it happens all the time, you would address it to the custodian of records, Office of the Attorney General, P.O. Box 899. That happens to be another retired judge from the Western District Court of Appeals. His name is Judge Joseph Danderand. So Judge Danderand's in Jefferson City. If you want records, it'll go through his office, and we will respond. And we will say, item number two, that the custodian shall make public records available for inspection or copying during regular business hours at the Supreme Court building as provided by law. If you want to come by and view those documents, you come by when we're open. I would invite you to let us know in advance that you want them because it might take us some time to find them. But you're going to come by and you need to put in the policy, come by when we're open. Number three, we say that the custodian shall respond to all requests for access to or copies of public records within the time period provided by statute. What does the statute say when it comes to compliance and response? It says that the custodian shall respond as soon as possible. <coughs> And in no event later than the third business day following receipt of the request. So if the custodian receives that request on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is the respond date. What does respond mean? Well, it means that you must respond in some fashion within 72 hours. But it also says you have to respond as soon as possible. So now we've got another balancing act going on here. Because if you have the records that are being requested, and you can respond as soon as possible, and that's 30 minutes from now, do that. But the reality is, particularly as it pertains to our office, and perhaps with yours as well, Judge Danderand is located in Jefferson City, and some records are kept in the Supreme Court building. Very few. Some of them are in the Broadway office building, where we have six floors of attorneys. Some of them are down the street in the archives. Some of them are in our office in Kansas City, or Springfield, or Cape Girardeau, or St. Louis. So it is sometimes impossible for us to have this documentation in 72 hours, but we must respond. So we will send out a letter to the person inquiring for the records, or requesting records, and we will say, we're, in essence, we're in receipt of your records request uh, regarding the Sunshine Law. This is what we believe that you have asked us for, and we will have these records, and then we tell them how long it's going to take. Seven days, 10 days, 14 days, 20 days, whatever it might take for us to gather that information, photocopied if that's the way that they want it, redact what they're not entitled to see, and get it out to them. That is what complying with the records request would be in terms of the response. Working as soon as possible, recognizing that the people of the state of Missouri are going to ask us to do a lot of things in benefiting the state of Missouri. And not all of those things can be done in records request within a three-day period. We have this responsibility to work on it as, and get them that information as soon as possible and be in contact with them to let them know how long it's going to take. We go on to say that the fee which may be charged uh, for furnishing copies, public records, and those fees will be as follows, a fee of $40 per hour for activities performed by an attorney. Sometimes I'll come community, I'll get a gas fee of $40 an hour, and I will simply say, and I don't mean to be frivolous, if you can get an attorney to work for you for $40 an hour, you have them give you gift certificates, hand them out to the kids at Christmas time. We go on to say that a fee of $20 per hour for activities performed by other staff, including time required to locate, prepare, and copy responsive documents. You can put $20 an hour, you guys are getting rich work for the Attorney General, let me just clarify something. If you are not an attorney and you work in the office of the Attorney General, you're a highly educated professional. And your salary would likely break down to $20 an hour because we include benefits. That's what it costs the people of the state of Missouri to have Tom Durkin come and work. 
Now, I never address Sunshine Law requests. But if you took my salary, plus the benefits and all the things, that, the perks that come with being a state employee and the reason why it can be uh, a, a position where you can afford to live in Jefferson City and work there, it, your salary would break down to about 20 bucks an hour. That's going to, it's going to vary depending on where you live. So the salaries here in Christian County are, could be different than what the salary would be in McDonald County or in St. Louis County or in Jackson County. So you will gear it based on what the salary level is for the area in which you live. And I will speak more to that, I think, right now. We say documents may be furnished without charge or at a reduced charge when the Office of the Attorney General determines that a waiver or a reduction of the fee is in the public interest and not primarily in the commercial interest of the requester. The fees which may be charged, uh, the Sunshine Law says this, that the fee which may be charged shall be the least salary, shall be the average salary of the least salaried employee capable of complying with the records request. So, we can't bill out Xeroxing at the IT director's salary. We have to do it at the person who's running the Xerox machine. So the least, the average salary of the least salaried employee is what's going to be used. And we go on and say in our policy, and we may choose to waive or reduce that fee. If we think that it's in the interest of the state of Missouri and not necessarily in the interest of just the requester. Having said that, let me tell you the reality of what I'm seeing take place in our office, and it is this. Uh, we choose to waive virtually every fee because of who we are. Um, I was not around in 1973 when this law was enacted by the legislature. I didn't come to Jefferson City till 77. So I wasn't around to hear the discussion that took place in the committees or on the Senate or House floor. But here's something I'm comfortable stating about the Sunshine Law. It was never the intention of the legislature to bankrupt you complying with Sunshine Law requests. So fees for services seems to be a pretty good idea. In fact, where I live in Cole County, if we had somebody in Cole County who was constantly contacting the commission, maybe because they didn't like one of the commissioners, it happens, and they want to use the Sunshine Law as a bludgeoning stick to extract their pound of flesh. And so they're going to keep that commission busy every single day responding to records requests. As a taxpayer in Cole County, I would hope my county commission would charge a fee for the services that is in keeping with the Sunshine Law. Because I don't necessarily want all my tax dollars in Cole County to go for the purposes of responding to this individual who seems, in my opinion, to have an axe to grind. Having said that, that citizen is absolutely entitled to ask and to receive. And on occasion, a, a, a well-intended clerk will contact me and say, isn't there a point where this becomes harassment? And the answer is no. No. And there's going to be people who don't, who don't like us. You know, I'm one of five children. Please don't play this in Michigan. I have three sisters that live in Michigan. I have a brother who lives in South Carolina. I'm one of five children. Bonnie, Lynn, Tom, Terry, Bill. I have a sister, not you, uh, that I don't get along with. And we pretend to get along at the holidays for the sake of the family. And between us, I'm looking for the adoption papers because I cannot imagine my parents brought her into this world. <laughs> <laughs> if I can have a sister that I do not get along with, certainly within a huge county there could be individuals who do not like one another. It happens. But we cannot let those personality differences enter into our discernment as to who gets record, who doesn't, and when they get them, and how much we're going to charge. Everyone is entitled that's what the law is all about. And by the way, I don't think I prefaced this. The Sunshine Law, 1973. Let's go back in history. 1973, <coughs> I was a senior at Drury University. I know, I look far too young to be that old, but there you go. I remember spending the spring of my senior year at Drury transfixed by a television program that was being brought to us by the Senate Watergate Committee. And as I watched that program on television unfold, I have to tell you, through a young man's eyes, I became a bit disenchanted with what had been taking place in Washington. <laughs> on August 9, 1974, my family had moved to Jamestown, New York, and I was flying from Jamestown back to St. Louis. August 9, 1974, the headline in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette had two words. Nixon resigns. President of the United States resigned office. Why? Not because there was compelling evidence to suggest he ordered a break-in into a building in Washington, but there was compelling evidence to suggest he was part of a conspiracy to cover up information. And the General Assembly was watching that same TV program. And that was what 
precipitated the introduction of what was Senate Bill 1, the first revision of the Sunshine Law, the first version of the Sunshine Law. So the response to what was taking place in Washington, and our state was saying, you know what happened there? Not in Missouri, because we're going to have a law that presumes openness, and people are going to be entitled to see those records. In the office of the Attorney General, we believe that is the basis for good government. So we're going to have conflicts, we're going to have people who don't like us, we're going to have people who might, it might appear to us that are harassing us. They are entitled to this, and it serves the greater good by doing that. Uh, I want to say a couple of final words on electronic <coughs> records. Let us first go to the definition of what is a public record, and that is also found on page 47. I was speaking with Mr. Jones earlier about records and the Sunshine Law. And there's, there's two different approaches to this. If you are a public governmental body, there are certain records that the Secretary of State requires you to maintain and retain for a period of time. And they have a retention schedule. What do you need to keep and how long do you need to keep it? And the Secretary of State deals with all those matters of what they're talking about. That's a public record. The Sunshine Law really isn't considering what the Secretary of State has defined as public records. The Sunshine Law simply says this, page 47, a public record is any record, whether written or electronically stored, retained by or of any public governmental body. And then they put in a lot of things that that includes. If you have it, the Sunshine Law says, you consider that a public record, subject to the Sunshine Law. If you have it. Now that becomes dicey in the world in which we live today because it says whether written or electronically stored. So now we've got to start to consider things like email. And then we live in a world where it seems we are becoming fixated, or at least about a billion people who are using social network sites of sharing way too much information on those social network sites. And they take that mentality into the office. And now they're using a public computer to say things that they likely shouldn't be saying using a public office computer. And then the question occurs, is that a public record? Can people see that? And the answer is case by case basis. But I can tell you what the philosophy is in the office of the Attorney General, and I'd invite you to use it if you're a member of a public governmental body. Do not say anything in an electronic document that you're not prepared to see in the press tomorrow. Don't do it. Are there times when I say things that I would not want to have recorded by the press? Absolutely. And I say them directly to a colleague over lunch. Not in an email. There have been times where I have started an email and I'll say, you know what? You need to back away from this for about an hour, Tom, and then you come back to it after you've had a chance to cool off. And then look at it. And then maybe send it to or show somebody else before you sit, hit send. Because you could be creating a document that other people are going to be entitled to see, and it could cause you embarrassment. In the four years now I've been in the office, my best recollection is the Attorney General's office has been involved in three lawsuits that are Sunshine Law related. Three. The last one that I'm aware of involved a public governmental body and email. And Citizens asked for the email from the public, public governmental body. They said, we're not going to share it with you. Our office looked at it and said, look, you use public equipment. It involved public business. You sent it out to public employees. I don't know how you can protect it. And we took the action to court, honestly, so that we could get case law to guide us. It was settled before a judge adjudicated and uh, an agreement was reached that those records would be released, which is not that much different than what took place before I ever worked for the attorney general with the former governor and records. Okay. And it was a big dust up. And it cost government a lot of money because people created documents that they did not want other people to see. And so I'm going to just encourage you and invite you to talk to your staff and your employees and just and remind them, if you don't want to see this in the paper tomorrow, then do not put it in an electronic document. That's the essence of what I would like to say to you in the hour that we're together. I think it is, it is the broadest way to look at the Sunshine Law. Uh, I will be happy now to stick around and address questions, and we can do that in an open arena or privately. I, I have no particular agenda when it comes to that. I don't want people to think I'm keeping secrets, so I'll do either. Uh, I see a question in the back. Sir. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the 
I have one that uh, pertains to a public meeting, and, and it's just going back to the definition here a little bit. To okay. Help me. A public meeting, any meeting of a public governmental body subject to section 1610, 1630, at which any public business is discussed, decided, or public policy formulated, and I'll stop at that comment. It appears to me by this that discussion is very important in a meeting, in a public meeting. I guess my question is, uh, if a public governmental body uh, feels that they're only going to discuss public business, does that still require notification? That is, if uh, uh, you think that the only time that you need to notify is if you're going to have a motion to vote. If you're going to discuss public business in a meeting, that still should be notified for the public to come in and be part of the discussion. I want to start by, first of all, let us identify what a public meeting is. And a public meeting is a, is a meeting of the body where there's a quorum present. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if we have a quorum of the body, and I don't care if they're at a coffee shop here in Ozark, and they're discussing public business, that is a public meeting, whether they like it or not. Now, interestingly, one of the, com one of the concerns that Brenda got last year, and I'll read to you exactly what it says, because I think it will go a long way to okay. give you information. In my town, the mayor, a councilman, and a police officer meet regularly at the local diner, and they discuss city business. I believe this is a violation of the Sunshine Law, and I'd like to know what your office is going to do about it. And this is why it's better than Brenda get that mail than me. <laughs> what are we going to do about it? <clears throat> Here's what we did. We found out that the public governmental body in question here was a body of five. The email said that the mayor and a councilman and a police officer are meeting regularly and discussing public business. The police officer was not a member of the body. So we have two of five talking public business uh, in a public area. Let's go to page 13. Does the Sunshine Law apply to a meeting of members of a public governmental body where public business is discussed, but a quorum is not present? Under the Sunshine Law, a meeting takes place when a majority or quorum of the public governmental body gathers to discuss or vote on public business. And then we've cited case law. However, it's important to note without a quorum present, no real decision making can take place. Further, if the public and the full public governmental body are not given proper notice of a surreptitious meeting, the body will not have the benefit of full disclosure and exchange of the ideas. It goes on to say, it also must be remembered that the Sunshine Law will apply to meetings of groups with less than a quorum when the entity is deliberately attempting to evade the Sunshine Law. And how might that happen? Well, the mayor meets with Councilman 1 for coffee on Monday, Councilman 2 on Tuesday, Councilman 3 on Wednesday, Councilman 4 on Thursday, and Friday they get together and magically pass the city budget without discussion. There's case law that guides us to say that that was intentionally done to circumnavigate the Sunshine Law. I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> and I'm going to call it the Aflac decision because the courts will say it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. We have a violation of the Sunshine Law. Within there, I believe, is the answer to your question. If a public governmental body, a quorum of the body is a meeting, and they are discussing public business, there needs to be a notice saying we are going to meet, here's the date, the time, the place, and here's what we're likely to talk about. A tentative agenda in a manner reasonably calculated to advise the public of the matters to be discussed. Okay? Good. Any other questions? Ma'am. Um, as you uh, post these notices, I know that some of them are posted in the newspaper, and I want to commend my county commission and planning and zoning I mean, they are just exemplary in being open and posting things in the newspaper, but there are other entities in the county. At what point would they have to publish it in the newspaper rather than just post it on their wall? Or at, do they? At no point do they have to post it in the paper. Okay, they do not ever have to do that. They say that the, they say that the, the notice shall be placed at the, at the at the location of the meeting or where that entity meets and gathers, and that's the primary place. But now let us go to Mr. Durkin's classroom and the least standard of the Sunshine Law. 
The least standard is we will post it at the place where the meeting is going to be held. The greater good is served by allowing as many people as possible. It appears that that's what takes place here in Christian County. And you're to be commended for that. I, I want to take that question about a half a step further because I've actually had clerks come to me and say, Tom, the mayor has instructed me to put on every agenda at the bottom and will go or may go into executive session pursuant to the Sunshine Law or pursuant to Section 610021, Subsection 1, Subsection 2, and Subsection 3, which would mean that they have now posted on their agenda that they may go into executive session to discuss legal action, uh, real estate purchases, or personnel matters. And then the clerk will create going to create conflict between you and the citizens you represent, eventually. Okay? Um, did that come close enough to answer your question? And then some, huh? All right, well, I'm Irish. You know, I'm in front of people, I'm just going to keep talking. There we go. Um, if it says on the agenda that is um, discussion, and there are motion votes taken, is that proper notice to the public about what is going to happen? You know, I'm going to go to that case-by-case -case basis term that we use so often. The definition says that, they, that there shall be an agenda that is likely to give the people the ideas of what is going to be discussed. And therein, if there's going to be an issue about, well, I didn't think you posted it, we have an adage around our office, which is, you never want to be the reason for case law being established. I'm sure the council here can appreciate that. You don't want to be the reason why case law is established because it's going to cost you a lot of money to try to determine whether you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong. So, so all I can say is make that agenda as clear as possible as to what you're going to be discussing and stick to that so that that agenda represents to the public the items that they are going to be interested in maybe hearing about. I don't know, I don't know if I've answered your question or not. Yeah, you did. Okay, very good. Let, let us err to caution. Ma'am. What happens if somebody requests a sun, something from the Sunshine Law and it cannot be located? Yeah. What do you do? You say, you tell them the truth. Because the Sunshine Law says that a public record is any record, whether written or electronically stored, retained of or by the public governmental body. I was in... Is it Dallas County where Buffalo is located? Am I right on that? Yeah. And I was up there talking to the commission. It was about three years ago. And they had had an ice storm. And the ice storm caused pipes to freeze. And when the pipes froze, there was a release of water that went on archived documents. And so the commissioner said to me, they're destroyed. What do we do if somebody asks for them? I said, you can only get what you possess. All right. Now, you know, I... You and I both know that there's going to be people who are going to say, you're not giving it to us because you don't want to give it to us. And your thing is, no, we don't have it. And the Sunshine Law does not speak to that litigation. And so, you know, and here again, I, I think if I can just take it down the road a half a step, if the public governmental body has demonstrated consistently throughout time that they have been transparent and open in trying to respond to requests for information or people attending their meetings, and they've, and they've handled everything with great integrity, I think the person is then going to be more inclined to say, you lost it? Uh, darn it, rats, what have you. Remember the attorney general who's the only one who has a number? Okay, this is not him, but it is a solicitor calling, so I apologize. Um, you can't give them what you don't have. I would, I, would, I would put that in some fashion to the satisfaction of the person who's making the request. Are some documents protected from this? I'm thinking particularly of building and home plans that are submitted to for building codes and things. If they're retained, they are actually the property of an individual. Are those documents releasable? They are, unless there would be a provision that would exempt them. And, and, and what what comes to my mind is that perhaps the person, the individual who gave it to the public governmental body, would say that there are trade secrets in there that cannot be released. And so under the trade secret provision, you would say these are exempt. And let me just point something out to you. There is one catch-all uh, 
exemption in here. It's on page 54. It's number 14. And by catch-all might not be an appropriate term, but I'll clarify in a moment. Records which are protected from disclosure by law. In other words, there could be an exemption. Your FERPA laws, for example, would be an exemption that's not specified in the 20 provisions that are still active, but they are specified in terms of number 14. This is a record which is protected by law by another entity, by another by the federal government, by the so purple laws. But say, for instance, in our case, the village could not pass an ordinance protecting house plans from the disclosure? Sunshine Law isn't interested in your ordinance saying we're going to exempt this any more than a certain records that might have confidential stamped on the top, and you say, well, we're not going to release this because it says confidential. Sunshine Law says if you have it, if you're a public governmental body and you have it, it is subject to the Sunshine Law. Unless you can find an exemption that allows you to not release it. But the fact that your organization, because trust me, there are governmental bodies across the state that would say, and we're going to exempt all of this stuff. Because we don't want to share it with anybody. It's none of their business. Sunshine Law doesn't recognize that. They say if you've got it, it's a public record, and you need to exempt it by using the provisions that are found in this law. Okay? Let me go back here first, sir. At what point does legal action go to the file? You know, case by case basis, you're, you're, going to, you're going to go, if you have legal action, and, you, and in this case, legal action would be for the, perhaps the, the closed session. We're going to go into a closed session to discuss legal action. Well, actually, I was thinking more in terms of the, if, if one party was suing another party, these documents in our office were part of the lawsuit. I don't want to give you a blanket answer on this. Okay. I, I, I think that I would just leave myself in great in dire straits by doing that. But certainly that is a question you need to go to your legal counsel and discuss. And if that legal counsel would like to speak with some of our counsel in governmental affairs, we can arrange to do that. Okay? It's a better way to go. Okay, here. Yes, are elected officials held to the same rule as far as closed talking personnel matters, or is that strictly for employees, hired employees? Take me to that. I'm not sure that I'm understanding your question, so okay, can you... Okay, if you have a matter where you need to discuss something with an alderman or a mayor or a person that's been elected to an office, okay, can that be done in an open session, or should that go to closed? An elected official is not an employee, right. and therefore an elected a discussion of an elected official who's not an employee cannot be exempt. And you and I can both appreciate how uncomfortable that might be. <laughs> Employees are protected, not elected officials, okay? Because they are not personnel. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Any final questions? Yes, sir. What about volunteers on boards and things like that? Volunteers are not employees, okay? And, and our office recognizes that that could be uncomfortable, but they're not employees. And therefore, they would not be subject to being exempted from that discussion in a, in a closed meeting. Tom, I got a question. You talked about Brenda and her high praise. Seems like every time I've talked to her, she waffles. You can quote me on that. <laughs> she won't take any offense to that. But she always, well, gets your turn in. I just want her to interpret the law. And she, she always wants you to get your She She does, and here's why. And both Brenda and I, we haven't been reprimanded, but we have been reminded of what the name of our office is. Tom, we are the Office of the Attorney General, not the Office of the General Attorney. Okay? And so the fact that Attorney General Coster has said, let us offer people guidance on this, is in some fashion his commitment to this statute. At the same time, it is, not our, um, it is not within our purview to give legal counsel to people unless you are an employee of the state of Missouri and you come to us for that. And so there's any number of citizens who want us to go to bat for them in a legal dispute, and we're not authorized to do that. And that's what Brenda is doing. She's saying, I can't give you legal counsel, but I can, and you need to go to your own attorney. 
and let them give you counsel. And then if that attorney had a question and they wanted to discuss with our attorney ways to look at it, they would do that. But we would not, at the, at the bottom of every document we send out, please do, do not construe this as legal advice from the Office of the Attorney General. So Brenda is, by her very position, restricted. And I can appreciate you'd like us to, but we're not authorized to. So we don't. When we get through this meeting, it'll take you about 50 minutes to get to see more. But don't forget I'll let you look at some minutes and tell me about it. Okay, I'll be happy to, to look at them and opine in my informal fashion. Okay, anything else? Because I know the commissioner has other things to do and, and I need to answer some questions and then I can need to get. Okay, last question. Are you ready? I'm going to give you a final answer. Go ahead. Is it, I know we were reading on the internet about um, it's okay for a husband and wife to be on a box huh? on the board. But what about a mother and daughter? Okay. Nepotism questions have nothing to do with the Sunshine Law. Okay. And, and those are questions that need to be addressed elsewhere. Um, and, and so ethics is where that would come in. All right. And so I, I'm not, I'm not going to venture down that road. But there certainly are laws or, uh, that are in place regarding the ethics of a public governmental body and nepotism. And I, and I can tell you, I'll give you my final example of my good friend John Landwehr. He has two children, and both of those children wanted to be lifeguards in the city of Jefferson, and while he was mayor, they could not. Okay? Nor would he fix any of their parking tickets for them. <laughs> Suffered dearly. <laughs> Citizens and members of the public governmental body, thank you for your time today. Thank you.